Thank, thank you so. Thank you so much, everybody. And before I uh, start, I would just like to say, make a small disclaimer, that prior to this talk, I used to think that Nita and Sanjay are my good friends, till they pitched me in a debate versus Dr. A.K. Singh, and <laughs> the heart that is beating is mine. And what you can see over here from the David and Goliath, I leave you to interpret that what are two endocrinologists doing in this room discussing diabetes medicines in the context of the heart. So I will be speaking regarding GLP-1 receptor agonist and ASCVD risk reduction. Now what we do know that type 2 diabetes is a complex pathophysiology from Dr. DeFranzo's Banting lecture that there are at least eight things that go wrong. We also know that the risk of macrovascular complications increases even before the diagnosis of diabetes. Therefore, as clinicians, you need to think of type 2 diabetes as two diseases, the microvascular and the macrovascular. What this means is that atherogenesis precedes type 2 diabetes, because by the time the patient comes to you, he already has preclinical atherosclerosis. Hence, it behooves you as clinicians to think of the disease in terms of a cardiorenal metabolic risk continuum so that you can ultimately prevent CV death in your patients. In the recent years, the presence or the emerging newer CVOT data has prompted international as well as local guidelines to change. And this allows us as clinicians to offer an opportunity to our patients. And this is the background for my talk today is why do we have GLP-1 agents that we will talk in the context, not of diabetes, but more in terms of ASCVD. This is an extract taken from the recent 2022 American Diabetes Association guideline. I'm going to zoom in for the compelling indications for this class of agent known as a GLP-1 receptor agonist. You can see that the, A the ADA says, irrespective of the HbA1c, irrespective of metformin use or your desired A1C goal for the patient, if the patient has AVS-CVD, your first-line therapy choice should be a GLP-1 receptor agent. And in the presence of heart failure and CKD, it can be SGLT2. But if there is a contraindication, you need to pick the GLP-1 receptor agent. Now, how did all this begin? In 2015, when the empa reg outcome trial was published in the New England Journal, it was exciting. Our jaws were dropping when we saw that empagliflozin versus placebo caused about a 14% risk reduction in the primary outcome, which was the three-point mace. So the audience needs to understand this means CV death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke. However, what we see is that this endpoint was driven largely by the reduction in CV death, which was 38%. But empagliflozin had not much effect on non-fatal MI and, in fact, increased the chance of having a non-fatal stroke. Along came the LEADER trial. And the LEADER trial with liraglutide versus placebo was very exciting because not only did it reduce the three-point mace, but this was driven by a reduction in all three parts of the three-point mace, which is CV death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke. This result was seen also now in the other GLP-1. So you can see that in leader trial with liraglutide, in the rewind trial with dulaglutide, you have a 12 to 13% risk reduction in the three-point mace. And then along came sustain with semaglutide subcutaneously, which showed almost a double of that 26% risk reduction. I think that's fantastic. That's good numbers for our patients. Now, you will say that we have oral versus injectable, but we have similar results. We are starting to see from the oral semaglutide trials the time to first occurrence of CV death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke, about a 21% reduction with a fantastic reduction in HbA1c and body weight versus placebo. What's reassuring to see that we now have about eight CV outcome trials for the GLP-1 receptor agonist. I will just point you to the green arrows that these results for the three-point maze have been maintained, about you know, 13 to 14% risk reduction. And if you look at CV death, also that benefit has been maintained across all the CV outcome trials. We spoke about kidney disease as being a major risk factor for CV outcomes. So you can see from this trial that the GLP-1 receptor agonists reduce the risk of developing macroalbuminuria. And also, they can be used all the way down up to a GFR, even less than 30, and even in our patients who may have more significant damage than that. And this is, again, a plus point to bear in mind. 
Now, I just mentioned to you that in the MPAREG outcome study, there was a questionable and very worrisome increase in the stroke risk with SGLT2 inhibitors. What we see from the analysis of LEADER, SUSTAIN6, and PIONEER6, that the pool data shows a significant 32% risk reduction in the risk of stroke. So bear in mind when we talk about AVS-CVD, we are talking about cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. This has in fact prompted the American Heart Association to change their guideline that GLP-1 receptor agonist should be added to metformin regardless of baseline HbA1c for stroke prevention. So again, something in favor of the GLP-1s. Now what about the SGLT2 and MACE outcomes? We now have several trials since the MPAREG outcome. What we can say is that the effects are not consistently observed across trials or across all patients with ASCVD. So if you look over here, these patients are divided into patients with ASCVD and no ASCVD, and a pooled estimate of about 11% risk reduction, and on the patients who did not have prior ASCVD, in fact, we don't see much of a benefit. It's all of almost a neutral effect. What about patients with ASCVD uh, in SGLT2? Now let's look at the risk of CV death. Again, this effect seems to be the highest only with empaglyph flows in, and we don't see. In fact, when the Virtus CV trial came out, it was a bit disappointing. We saw that this risk was very neutral. The numbers were not great. So putting all this data together, we have several published trials, and we have several in the pipeline also looking at CV outcome trials. And what the data shows us so far is that GLP-1 receptor agonists show greater effects on ASCVD endpoints. The SGLT2 inhibitors certainly have an impressive reduction in hospitalization for heart failure and kidney outcomes. The Cochrane database of systematic reviews similarly looked at this and had the same conclusion for CV mortality. Fatal or non-fatal MI, fatal or non-fatal stroke, the GLP-1 receptor agonists are superior, whereas if you start looking at heart failure and kidney function, we do have the SGLT2 inhibitors. This is a similar slide just to show you the numbers. Okay. Okay. So as clinicians, as researchers, as people who are taking care of these complex patients with diabetes who have underlying heart disease, kidney disease, we need to think as to what is driving these differences. So like our commander-in-chief from Ahmedabad, since I'm from Ahmedabad, Dr. Bansi is from Ahmedabad, we need to think, is it glycemic control? Is it the benefit for weight reduction? Are there other risk factors involved? What are the putative mechanisms that we need to work on so we can work not on the failing heart? So SGLT2 inhibitors, improved hospitalization for heart failure, but we need to prevent these pathways. Or is it the population studied and what is the implication for treatment for us? So just to put this in perspective, we know that SGLT2 inhibitors don't do as well as GLP-1 agonists in terms of weight loss and HbA1c reduction. Now, if some of you may recall the Look Ahead trial, which was designed to look at weight reduction and CV outcomes, and we know it was neutral or negative, which means weight reduction did not impact simply the reduction in CV outcome. So we don't think that's the only signal. We also know that there is a legacy effect with glucose control, but that is not the only reason. Now bear in mind, ASCVD is a long process. We are not here for the quick fun. We are here to have sustainable benefits on glucose control. We are here to have sustainable benefits on ASCVD protection. So this is where I will draw some slides. So what I have done is over here, I have taken this diagram. So to, to your left, you are seeing the results from the EMPARAG outcome. What I've done is I've drawn these dark lines. So as you can see, we started seeing the treatment difference, which was the difference in CV death as early as three months. Now, how long does it take to develop macrovascular complications? We know it takes years, five years, 10 years. We don't know. We also know that from the effects on the GLP-1 receptors in leader trial and sustained six, this, the, the curve started separating from placebo at about one year and was even more at two years. So what this tells you is that there is something happening in the SGLT2 group which is quick, which is happening early on, but however, the GLP-1 receptor agonists may be working more on the atherosclerotic pathway. We now know from the Lira flame trial that they may reduce CV inflammation as measured directly going to the vessels, looking at the coronary artery calcium scores and the lesion sizes. But we also know that from markers of inflammation, oral semaglutide reduces systemic inflammation as measured by HSCRP. 
So putting this together, I would say that the GLP-1 receptor agonist, it's a bit of a busy slide, have several effects. Working at the atherosclerotic pathway, working on the markers of inflammation, preventing, or you start early in the process, as I showed you early, that patients with type 2 diabetes, atherosclerosis predates. So you want to offer the benefit early on to your patient, because by the time they present to you, they already have some pre-atherosclerosis, some lesions going on. SGLT2 inhibitors. Now we widely accept that most of the benefits from SGLT2 inhibitors come from an improvement simply in ventricular loading conditions. They cause an osmotic diuresis, reduction in preload, natriuresis, and afterload reduction. Improvement in the myocardial sodium exchange inhibition happens as well as at the level of the kidney, working on the afferent arteriolar pressures. Now, we do not have any data suggesting what is going to happen in the long term if you stop the SGLT2, because these are not happening pleiotropically speaking. These may just be immediate effects. So we don't have any uh, mechanisms to identify. We certainly hope that using the cardiac metabolism pathway and the bioenergetic pathway, there are changes happening at the myocardial structural level as well. Now, just to end the talk, I would like to present uh, a study by my very worthy opponent today, CV outcome trials looking at Asians with SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. Very nicely done, Dr. Avdesh, so I really appreciate the study. In this study, what he did is he looked at uh, three-point maze outcomes in CVOTs with SGLT2 inhibitors in Asians. The number was kind of disappointing to him also. We found that less than a 10 to 11% reduction, so not very impressive like we've seen in the other trials for the three-point maze outcomes. But what did he find with the GLP-1 receptor agonists? I'll just simply read out his conclusions to you. The meta-analysis found a significant reduction in MACE with GLP-1 receptor agonists, but not with SGLT2 inhibitors in Asians. No significant reduction even in the hospitalization for heart failure or CV death with SGLT2 in Asians. So maybe there is some ethnic difference also that we are missing. Whether these results are related to ethnicity, Due to the way the studies are powered, underrepresentation we remains to be established, but really shocking to see that when we are practicing in India, we need to be thinking what are we offering to our patients. In fact, I'll end with the ADA and ESD guidelines. They behoove you again to think of GLP-1 receptor agonists, even before metformin as per the ESC guidelines in the high-risk patient with ASCVD. Dr. DeFranzo has just put together this very nice uh, Comparison between, uh, this is just a recent article from 2018, and it talks about MACE and atherogenesis. The double arrows point mean that there is stronger benefit. The single or the whiter arrow means there is lesser benefit. So you can see GLP-1 receptor agonists do very well. You can also see for A1C and weight reduction, the GLP-1 receptor agonists do very well. I did not show the slides on blood pressure and lipids, which was kind of comparable, but some more benefit with the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Lastly, as you can see, most of the effects with the SGLT2 inhibitors seem to be with the natriuresis and the diabetic nephropathic pathway, and really more with reducing ventricular preload. So uh, we are not here to talk about safety, tolerability, and cost today. We assume in an ideal world, if we could compare GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2, you still have to keep in mind the risks when you're selecting this agent. What factors will you keep in mind? GLP-1 receptor agonist, as all the guidelines and the data so far shows, ASCDVD predominates, where MACE is the gravest threat, where more A1C reduction is needed, where weight loss is a high priority, and SGLT2 may be your choice when the heart has already failed. So if you want to prevent that, you want to select a better agent, you want to work on the pathophysiology of ASCVD. Lastly, I'll just end with a quote saying, benefit delayed is benefit denied. Keep that heart pumping, and let's work on the atherosclerosis pathway. Thank you very much for your kind attention.